Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am honored to stand before you, honored to be invited to be a part of this lectureship, honored to be an instructor at this esteemed institution, honored to be a brother in Christ. Please pray for us, the work in Rockingham, as we include you in our prayers as well. I'm truly honored to, to be associated with this school, and I pray that this institution will be blessed beyond measure, and its reputation would spread across this land and beyond. I thank Brother Sapp for the work that he's doing there, along with Brother Ron and the sponsoring congregation here. Please continue that great work. I'm also thankful to Brother Justin for such a remarkable lesson. It was indeed an encouragement to my heart. Amen. We, we ought to be uplifted, and trust is a vital factor in our, in our faith. My lesson this evening is cooperative versus rebellion. The text is Judges chapter 8, verses 4 through 17. Judges chapter 8. Verses 4 through 17. <clears throat> and Gideon came to Jordan and Passover. He and the 300 men that were with him faint, yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Sukkot, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me. For they be faint, and I am pursuing after Zebar and Zalmoner, kings of Midian. And the princes of Sukkot said, Are the hands of Zebar and Zalmoner now in thine hand? that we shall give bread unto thine uh, army. And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord had delivered Zabar and Zalmunar into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And he went up thence to Peniel, and spoke unto them likewise. And the man of Penuel answered him as the man of Sukkot had answered him. And he spake also unto the man of Penuel, saying, When I am come again in peace, I will break down thy tower. Verse 10. And Zebar and Zalmoner were in Kirkar, and the host with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of all the hosts of the children of the east. For there fell 120,000 men that drew to the sword. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelled in tents on the east of Noah and Jacob and, Jac and smote the hosts, for the hosts were secure. And when Zebar and Zalmoner fled, he pursued after them, and took the two kings of Midian, Zebar, Zobar, and Zalmoner, and disconquered all the hosts. And Gideon the, uh, Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle before the sun was up, and caught a young man of the man of Sikoth, and inquired of him, and he described unto him the princes of Sikoth, and the elders thereof. 
even threescore and seven men. And he came unto the man of Sukkot and said, Behold, Zebar and Zalmunna, with whom you did upbraid me, saying, Of the hands of Zebar and Zalmunna, now in thine hand, that we shall give bread unto thy man that are weary. And he took the elders of the city, and cones of the wilderness, and riders, and with them he taught the man of Sukkot. And he beat down the tower of Peniel and slew the man of the city. Cooperative <clears throat> versus rebellion. Now the question tonight is, which camp will you cast your lot in tonight? Is it, in, is it in the camp of cooperative attitude, or is it in the camp of rebellious attitude? Which camp will you choose on tonight? The book of Judges spans some 401 year period. 401 year. 12 judges rule during this tumultuous time in Israel's history. These judges were not legal arbitrator in the modern sense of the word. They were military generals who rescued God's people from foreign occupation and the practices of idolatry. There is a consistent pattern that emerges in this book. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of God. As a consequence, God allowed the enemies of, of the nations to, to occupy Israel's border. Gideon was the, first, was the fifth judge in the succession of judges that God raised up to free Israel from the yoke of foreign bondage. Now from its inception, Gideon's ministry was plagued with insurmountable amount of rebellion or rebellious attitudes and rejections. Rebellion inserted itself in this biblical narrative in various shades of factions, discords, hostilities, distrust, suspicions, jealousies, and disloyalties. Now, unfortunately for, for Gideon, most of these rebellious attitude came from among his own people. Remember, Jesus said somewhere that a prophet is not without honor in his own country. Now, it was, or it would have been quite easy for, for Gideon to acquire a, a Jonah-like attitude. Flee the scene and lay the burden or lay the blame at the feet of someone else while abandoning God's people to the enemy. Instead, Gideon was a stand-up kind of guy. You know what we, we ought to be a stand-up kind of people in the presence of conflict, in the presence of negativity, and in their presence of rebellion. Though the level of cooperative attitude was very noticeable, Gideon remained a standard kind of guy. He cast a vision of faith in God's providence. He exercised wisdom in understanding God's promises. And Gideon remained a faithful person in spite of it all. He was neither impressed by the, uh, the, 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 the intimidation by the numerically superior army of the Medes. He was not impressed by that at all. Instead, Gideon was, he was aware 
that regardless of how numerically inferior his right child Ami may have been, he knew that if God was involved, recovery was present. He knew that if God was involved, he knew that victory was certain. Biblical history has taught us that it doesn't matter the size of the military forces. It doesn't matter whether the, the, army, the, the army had nuclear option of its day. It didn't matter. God was not to be found, or God was not to be measured nor qualified by the human strength of these, these armies. Instead, God was in the small armies of biblical history, such as the conflict with David and Goliath. And as we see here, Gideon with his 300 under-equipped, under-trained, and under-respect, respected army. We have to honestly decide which camp. We're going to cast all our lot and be a part of. From the text in question, let us examine some of the implication of, of rebellious and cooperative attitude that Gideon contended with. Now first, what does the text imply about a rebellious attitude? Before we go there, Let's consider a brief definition of what rebellion looked like in the eyes of God. Rebellion, a rebellious attitude or rebellion is defined as this to disobey, to be bitter, to provoke, and to rebel. I believe all of us, all of us have participated in this definition one way or the other. We all have disobeyed God's will. We all have rejected his continence. We have often displayed bitterness towards our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We provoke one another and on and on and on. In, in this context, it means to resist God in words. It means to resist God in thoughts and means to resist God in deeds or in action. You see, God is interested in the, in the inwardness of human affairs. He is, he is interested in the, in the inwardness of the person, not what we project from our mouths. He's interested in what's inside of us. I want to look at a few examples of rebellion, a few examples of incidents of rebellion on this next. And we see rebellion as ever present in verse 5 all the way through verse 12. First, after Gideon received his, his mission statement from God in his zeal, he attempts to, to rid his father's house, I'm going backwards here in chapter 6, the beginning of the story. He attempted his zeal to rid his father's house of idolatry practices. You see, Gideon was intent on, uh, on serving God the way God has or had prescribed through the law of Moses. Gideon had a, had a standard to, to follow. I believe that we look carefully in our faith, in our religion, like Moses, we too are given a standard to follow. And if there is any deviation from the standard, we ought to be held accountable. If there is deviation from the standard, brothers and sisters, I think we would have put ourselves in the category of a rebellious attitude. And this is what Gideon attempted to do. He wanted to clear his father's, his father's house of rebellion against, against God. 
But inter interestingly, interestingly, as a result of, the, of Gideon's zeal, Gideon received death threats from the townspeople. You know, when you when you attempt to do what's right, there are going to be naysayers, there are going to be challengers, there are going to be people who who are going to undermine your effort. Gideon's own hometown folks stood to, to execute and put him to death because of his zeal for God. What shall we do when religious impersonators invade our holy space? What shall we do? Should we give way to that invasion? Or should we push back like Gideon is pushing back here? These are what I call examples of mobster mentality, gangbangs. When little groups rebel in order to get their own way, they use uh, an they they try to intimidate this intimidation factor. So this is what Gideon's folks were, were attempting to do. They wanted to intimidate Gideon into compromise. Another example of an incident of rebellion. 22,000 of, 22, of Gideon's men, they resigned their military posts for fear of the enemy. Gideon got started with a group of 132,000 men. And Gideon told us, man, if you are afraid to fight the minions, you can go home. <laughs> no dereliction of duty. You can go home, no punishment. And as a result, 22,000 men went home because of fear of the enemy. Well, similarly, when, when, Jesus, when Jesus laid out a strategic condition of discipleship out of John chapter 6, most of his disciples used the occasion to, to abandon him. They said, well, what you say is too hard. It's too hard. Who can eat your flesh and drink your blood? I'm out of here. Jesus turned to the twelve. And he asked his twelve to make a decision. What side of the fence will you fall on? You make a decision. And Peter rightfully answered, Lord, I mean, to whom should we go? You have the word of life. Church ministry is a, is a lonely station. Rebellion in the Lord's house is, is depleting and eroding the confidence of the work of the church. The church is hemorrhaging, and this needs to stop. Because we are abandoning God's house, we are abandoning our Christian responsibilities out of fear like the 22,000 man that deserted Gideon. It needs to stop. Another example. The man of Ephraim, they were suspicious of Gideon's intent. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Their pride for recognition caused them to Overlook self uh, to overlook their selfishness. They were amused with themselves because they believed that no battle could be won unless they participate in it. That's rebellion. This is this is a rebel rousing 
This is rebel rousing at its best. When we think that our involvement has a direct effect on the public affairs and public opinion in the Lord's in the Lord's church. Another. The citizens of Sukkoth, out of chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, and the citizens of Peniel, uh, 8 and 9, they rejected Gideon and his armed forces as a group of ragtag nobodies. Don't we often look for, for, for status? We, 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 we like to be associated with the, with the social, with the elite social echelon. We like to be, we, 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 we like to be identified by perhaps the branding of our clothes, perhaps the, the neighborhood where we, where we live, perhaps the name brand of our cars. But these things lead to, to vanity, <laughs> rebelliousness. And this is what drove Sukkoth and Pinal against supporting Gideon. Because Gideon had a small army, and they didn't want to be caught on the wrong side of the fence. <laughs> I think they were in lockstep with public opinion. The Gideons, the large army, the army of 135,000 men against a right tide 300. Aren't we often intimidated by peer pressure? Our yeah. kids in school, they were hardened on, on a daily basis in peer pressure. We who are adults in our workplace, and even in the Lord's church, we are intimidated to do that which is right, even when we know what is right. Someone once told Jesus, out of Luke chapter 23 and 37. If you are the Messiah, then you ought to show yourself. If you are the Son of, that, of God, you come down off that cross, and if you do that, then that's enough for sufficient faith to, to obey you. The intent here is to create an artificial faith. How often church members refuse to do the work unless they can prove that some superficial success has to be present before they even do the work. How often you have individuals that are rebellion, re re rebelling, saying, well, this is not going to work, that's not going to work. Well, how do you know it's not going to work? How do you know? Have you ever participated in such a work? Maybe, maybe you can be the catalyst to prove that this particular method of evangelism or this particular strategy of ministry will be successful. Who are you paging? Who, who, who's a standard? Is it someone across the street maybe who had a bad attitude about what they were doing and didn't produce any result? Paul said on the second Corinthians 5 7 to Christians, by extension, us. He said that we walk by faith and not by sight. Because when we attempt to walk by sight, my friends, our behavior would succumb to the circumstances that surround us. And as Christians, the fruit of the Spirit is independent of circumstances that surround us. When we speak about, about love, agape love, what external circumstances drive agape love? Well, I believe that agape love is something that's internal, given to us by God, internal. So regardless of the storm, as Brother Justin mentioned, Regardless of the storm that, that, that rage over the Sea of Galilee, 
or the present storm that's passing over, over us, these things are not even sufficient to move or interrupt the agencies of the fruit of the Spirit, whether it be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc. When we allow things outside of us to interrupt our relationship with God and the church and our brothers and sisters, friends, we are done for. Rebelliousness is present. The implication of rebellion. The implication. Proverbs 17, 11 says, An evil man seeketh only rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. The implication, friends, is that rebelliousness or rebellion would receive his due reward. Now, if we look at the text more carefully, we can see this implication in this text. Cowards are leaders of rebellious attitude. That's right. Cowards are leaders of rebellious attitude against God. Zebar and Zelmoner with, with an army of 135,000 men, they fled the battlefield from Gideon and his 300 men. Sounds almost like the, the, the 300 men of Sparta. Of Sparta. 135,000 men fled from 300. Isn't that the height of cowardice? Cowardness? Now here, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 11.35. Paul said that, And the rest will I set in order when I come. Paul attempt to, to drive out the, the coward attitude out of the church of, of Corinth. Because Paul knows that rebellion is, is, is rebellion is led by cowards. The false prophets or false apostles who trapped Paul's steps didn't confront Paul. But what they did, they walked behind the work of Paul. The same thing is true of the church. Individuals who take on rebellion in the Lord's church, they too are cowards. Rebel, rebels run in attack, and they recruit vulnerable and susceptible minds. In other words, weak-minded people. They're not brave enough to go solo. They hide their identity in the crowd. They grab their, the weak as their shield. Paul say they, they, they lead captive silly women laden with sin. Second Corinthians 3, 6. Rebellious attitude always stifle cooperative attitude. Consequences always await the, the dastardly and the cowardly person. Again, out of the text, verse 12, Zebar and Zalmona, they fled. And what kind of reputation or respect would such leader have when they leave behind 135,000 men, whether dead or alive? To whom, to whom should they fled? Their country? Do you think that all of France would be extended out? Do you think they would, there would be a victory march when a commander, a commander-in-chief, abandoned 135,000 men? Cowards. The elders of Sukkot, they were shameless 
shamelessly beaten. There were cowards. The briar and the thorns of the desert was reserved for cowards. It was a public rebuke. And this is what Gideon did. The man of Peniel were, were put to death for their cowardly act. Verse 17. There are real consequences. There are real consequences, my friends, for, for rebellious attitude. Christians should be cautioned about participating in rebellion against God, His people, and His church. If we think that God doesn't see our secret behaviors, let's consult Ananias and Sapphira. Let Ananias and Sapphira testify of, of their deeds and the consequences they receive. I think it's there for all of our work. Whatsoever things are written before time are written for our learning. That's true of the Old Testament as well as the stories of the New Testament. Did Ananias and Sapphira do something? Did they, did, did, did what they do initially, was it, was it correct? Well, they sold their property like anyone else did. They sold their properties, but it was their attitude behind the selling of the property. They were rebelling against God. They were double dipping. You see, they, they hadn't really established what side of the fence they belonged to because they were double dipping in the church and in the world. It's a lesson for us. Rebellious attitude will be punished unmercifully. Which, which camp will you cast your lot in tonight? Would it be in the camp of <coughs> rebellion? This won't be a wise option. A rebellious attitude was, was detrimental to all who rose up against Gideon. How about trying something different? Something that works. How about trying a cooperative attitude instead of rebellion? Someone said that the definition of insanity is, is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. It's not working. It never works. You have man of rebellion in the scriptures. Old Testament, Moses rebelled against God. But Moses realized that it didn't work. So what Moses did, Moses turned. As Justin mentioned, Abraham, you see, Abraham used some trickery in deceiving the, the prince or, 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 or the pharaoh of Egypt. Jeremiah retired from his from his ministry, went into retirement, fell under God's people. But then he realized that he couldn't stay in his retirement. He had to come back and preach the message. It doesn't work. Coming into the presence of God and doing whatever we want to do is not going to work, brothers and sisters. It never works. So how about adopting a, a cooperative attitude? What does the text say about cooperative attitude? Well, we see some examples from verse 4 and verse 12. Cooperation is defined as a collaboration or an alliance. For the purpose of this text, I would import the meaning as having a proper attitude and a proper work in God's service. Illustrations of incidents of cooperation in this text. Gideon worshiped God, out of chapter 7. Gideon worshiped God when, he, when God's plan was revealed to him. You see, when Gideon realized that God is a God of promise, when Gideon realized that, that God's providence was with him, when Gideon realized that faith matters, the Bible says that Gideon worshiped God. You see, from the camp of chasing the enemy, or sorry, from the camp of, uh, uh, for, 
he went over spying on the enemies. From there, he went over to his camp. Before he got to his camp, he worshipped God. Because something was revealed to him. Friends, how much, how much more anxious should we be excited about worshipping God? <coughs> Knowing what happened on Calvary's cross for me and for you. The pain and the agony and the frustration of our Savior. For us, how much more excited we should be in worshiping the Almighty God. A, a cooperative attitude is grounded in the expectation that God will do what He promised. Well, Revelation uh, 2 and 10, the Bible says, Be faithful until death, and then you will receive a crown of life. That's a promise. That's a promise. That's a real promise. If we believe 2 Timothy 2, 16 and 17 is correct, then we must believe the promise that God has made. As a unit, Gideon's army pursued the enemy relentlessly. Leaders in the, in the Lord's church must be bold. Leaders in the Lord's church ought to be relentless. Leaders in the Lord's church ought to be unified as they pursue those who are in opposition to biblical truth. We ought to have spider senses in the lost church. We should not allow any Tom, Dick, and Harry from the outside to come and spoil what Jesus died for on Calvary's cross. We should smell them from a mile away. And we should rebuff, rebuff their interests. We should keep them out if they want to change what's within. The leaders ought to be bold, like Gideon, in a relentless pursuit of the enemy. A cooperative attitude 